Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. This is part three in our Unity C Sharp Basic series, where we're taking a look at how to write C Sharp code for absolute beginners with a Unity focus. Today, what we're gonna look at is the component lifecycle or order of execution of Unity events. This is really important to understand because you're already implementing some of these things like update, for example. Understanding exactly when update is called is a very important thing. So you can do something before it's called or after it's called based on the result of what happens there. The same goes for some of the other ones that we're going to look at today, which are awake, on enable, start, update, and fixed update. There are many more functions that get called automatically by Unity, as you can see in this diagram, but these are some of the most commonly called ones. There are a couple more that I use pretty frequently that are physics related, but we're not gonna get into those today. Awake is the very first thing that happens on a script. It happens as soon as it's instantiated, or it's the very first thing that happens whenever you load the scene, if that game object is already on the scene. Then on enable is called for all scripts as well. So every one of these that we're talking about today get called on every single mono behavior in the scene. After that, start gets called, and then we start entering into what's called the fixed update loop and also the update loop. Fixed update is something that we usually use for physics operations. It's a totally separate simulation happening on the physics side and then it gets rendered after the update loop. So whenever you're thinking about where should you put something, think about it in, is this a physics operation? If so, probably belongs in fixed update. If it's not, probably belongs in update. What we're gonna do in this video is instantiate objects at runtime. That way we can see when does await get called, when does on enable get called, when does start get called, fixed update and update. Generally speaking, when we're creating objects in Unity, we have a prefab and we want to make a copy of that and then maybe modify some stuff. We're not usually creating brand new game objects. We can, but that's not usually the case. We're usually instantiating prefabs and the way to do that is using this function that's available on all mono behaviors called instantiate. Whenever we do that, it creates a game object exactly as a clone of that prefab. And then we can do things like get component, which will return us different scripts on a particular game object to modify some of that behavior. In this one specifically, we're going to create some text that automatically destroys itself after some amount of time, which brings me to that second one that we're going to talk about. After we instantiate something, we will destroy something. That's how we remove it from the scene. It's effectively like pressing delete on your keyboard in the editor. Once the object has destroyed itself, it will obviously no longer be there. So we're gonna have it where it spawns, counts down, and then destroys itself. And we're gonna have a bunch of those going at the same time. On the script that we have that's gonna create those auto-destructing texts, we're going to override how long it takes for those to destroy themselves. And that's where we're gonna really dive into your understanding of these lifecycle events to show when we override that, at what point does that actually take place? Is it before awake? Is it after start, somewhere in between? The last thing, as always in all of my videos, the full project is available on GitHub. You can go there, download the project to see the end state, or you can just follow along as we're going through it. Also specifically for this series, every single reference that we're going to talk about, the documentation for that is going to be included in the description. So make sure that if you don't understand something that I'm talking about and you want a little bit more in-depth knowledge about it, you can go to the documentation page and read either the Unity or Microsoft documentation for more explanation. Before we go any further, I want to give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people, and that means more people are making their game dev dreams become a reality. If you want to help support that mission, you can go to patreon.com slash academy, choose whichever tier you're most comfortable with. You'll start getting some cool perks like getting your name up here in the section and getting a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. Speaking of those awesome supporters, I have Raphael, Andrew Bowen, Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Paul Berry, and Matt Parkin, I am so grateful for your support. Thank you. This scene is a little bit different than the last two scenes. We are no longer having text on screen by default. We're going to add text to the screen at runtime. So I still have a canvas with a black background. Nothing has changed there, but I now have a countdown text prefab that if I add it to the background, you can see this text prefab has no text by default, but if I type in it, some text shows up. You'll notice this repository does not have that previous count up and down script. I'll now create our new script called auto destroy text. Let's open that up in Visual Studio. 
in the auto destroy text class, the first thing we'll do at the very top is add an attribute to this class saying that we want to require a component that is type of text mesh pro UGUI. This is similar to that serialize field attribute. This one though is attached to the class, not to a field. All that this does is whenever we go into the Unity editor, if we try to attach the script to some object that does not have the Text Mesh Pro UGUI component on it already, it will automatically add that for us. If we try to remove the Text Mesh Pro UGUI component from a game object that has this script on it, the Unity editor will complain at us telling us that this script requires a Text Mesh Pro UGUI component so we cannot remove it. What this does is makes it a little bit easier on us so we don't have to serialize the text field that we're going to add in a second and we don't have to drag it in the inspector every time that we want to use this auto destroy text. What we're going to do is make it so it automatically sets up its own text mesh pro text reference. The first variable we'll define is a little bit different. We're going to go public float auto destroy time and set that to be 5f by default. So this auto destroy time will be a number, right, a float that we've set to 5 by default, but this is public. And remember in the first video in the series, I said you should not make things public unless you have a very good reason to. In this video, we do have a very good reason. We're going to actually modify this whenever we're spawning these at runtime to show you the life cycle of events that are happening. Maybe that doesn't make a ton of sense right now, but whenever we get there, I think it'll be very clear. Next, we'll add two private variables, a private text mesh pro UGY called text and a private float spawn time. Since we want this text to automatically destroy itself, we need to know when it was spawned so we know when we should destroy it. Next, we're going to define one of these lifecycle methods from Unity, the private void awake. Remember, awake is the very first thing that happens in the component lifecycle. The way I like to think about this is this is where we'll set up any references that we need internally for this script. So like I was saying earlier, we want this to have a text mesh pro text that gets automatically set up for us because we've required it as a component. So on awake, I'll do text equals get component text mesh pro UGUI. What get component does is searches this game object to see is this script or a component attached to this game object. If it is, it will return that reference to that component and we'll store that into, in this case, the text variable. This is really useful because a lot of our components may need to interact with other components. Like in this case, we want this script to interact with the text mesh pro UGUI component. This allows us to check without having to drag fields in the inspector for a particular component very easily in our code. That way, before anything else happens, I know text will not be null which is a default value when we don't assign a value to an object reference. What I'm going to do is define the next event that happens in the Unity lifecycle, the on enable. So we'll define private void on enable and set the spawn time to equal time dot time here. Now let's use the update loop. Remember update is called once per frame. We've already used it before. Now we're using it with a little bit more context about how does it get called and where in the lifecycle of this script does it get called. We'll define a float remaining time to equal spawn time plus the auto destroy time minus time dot time. This will tell us based on when we spawned, how much time is left before we should destroy this game object. Remember that time dot time is the current time in seconds since the application started. We'll check if the remaining time is less than or equal to zero. Then inside that block, we will destroy game object. And what game object is, is just a reference to our current game object. We're saying we want to destroy this, which I think it makes sense. We want to destroy it. We want to go away. You can also use destroy to destroy a specific mono behavior on a game object. That's why we're not just saying destroy this, because remember, this is reference to our current mono behavior. And that's not really what we want. We want the entire game object to go away. The last thing we'll do in here is set the text of the text mesh pro text to be the remaining time. So I'll do text.set text, passing in the string template with a dollar sign, quotes, passing in remaining time. And before you saw me do dot to string, pass in n2, just a week or two ago, somebody commented saying that there's a shorthand for this where you can do some variable colon and then the string format you want to use. So we're gonna use that in this video. Remaining time colon n2. So that's the same as doing remaining time dot two string passing in n2, which will give us our remaining time with two decimal places. Let's open up the Unity editor again, select the countdown text prefab and add our auto destroy text on this game object. Then I'll click play and drag the prefab into the scene. I'll make it a child of the background and we'll see that some text shows up and it starts counting down. 
Once it hits zero, it is destroyed and removed from the hierarchy. That's perfect. Now we have some text that as soon as it comes up, it will start counting down. And once it hits zero, destroy. That's not particularly useful though, because we can't make these at runtime. So now let's make a new C Sharp script called Object Spawner and open that up in Visual Studio. In here, we'll have a couple of private serialized fields, a float auto destroy time that will set to 10F by default, a bool spawn and fixed update, which will explicitly set to false. It's the same as if you don't set it equal to false, bools are automatically false, and an auto destroy text prefab. So this works the exact same as the text mesh pro text references that we've been using so far, except we need to drag this from the project panel, not from the inspector because this needs to be a prefab reference, not an active instance of the auto destroy text. And that's why we're calling it prefab, just to signify to ourselves that, hey, this is not some instance of auto destroy text. We want it to actually be that prefab. So as you can tell from spawn and fixed update being false, I'm gonna want to have a way to toggle between whether I want to spawn these objects in update or in fixed update. And I wanna show you the difference between the two. When we define update, we'll first check if not spawn and fixed update, that means if Spawn and fixed update is false. We want to do this. What we're going to put in there is just a method call. We're going to call a function called spawn object. Since we're going to have the exact same thing happen in fixed update and update, it just makes it a little bit easier if we define a function or a method that does this thing that we can just call without having to copy paste the code. That way later, if we want to come back and change how the object is spawned or do something else in there, we only have to change that in one place. It lowers the risk of something bad happening, missing copy pasting, or just forgetting to update it somewhere. We'll keep the same behavior. Let's define that with a private void because we don't want it to return anything, spawn object. In here, we'll do auto destroy text, text equals instantiate. First up is what do we want to instantiate a copy of? That's the prefab. Where do we want to spawn it? We're going to put a new vector three with a random range from zero to the screen width. Screen width is, well, how wide is your screen? As Unity understands it. This could be named a little better. It's really the player window, so or the size of the game screen, not your actual physical monitor screen size. So we're gonna pick a random point between zero and however wide your screen is. For the Y, the up and down, we're gonna go from zero to the height of the screen, so screen.height. And for the Z, we're just gonna keep it at zero. They'll all be the same depth. A vector three is really just three different floats organized in X, Y, and Z, all tied together in what's called a struct. For our purposes today, a struct is basically the same thing as a class. You can put in class member variables, you can put in functions. It doesn't do anything fundamentally different than a class for our purposes of what we're talking about today. There are some very important key differences that we can talk about in a future video, but for today, you can think of them as the same thing. You are actually already familiar with the vector three if you've used the transform component in Unity before. The position is defined as X, Y, and Z, right? And that position is a vector three. What you modify to rotate an object is also a vector three. It's stored differently than that, but that's what you're interacting with. We have to say new because we want to create a new vector three. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We want a new one and we're telling it, I want the new one to have these properties. When we say new and then we pass in these properties, that's called calling a constructor. We're constructing a new vector three and we're telling it, how should we construct it? We want it to have an X value of some value between zero and the screen width. We want the Y value to have some value between zero and the screen height, and we want the Z value to be zero. Third argument is what rotation should we give it? I'm gonna use the quaternion.identity. So quaternions are used to represent rotations. Identity means there is no rotation. When we want something to spawn with, you know, the zero, zero, zero rotation that you'd normally see on a rec transform, you're gonna use the quaternion.identity. Finally, on instantiate, we can optionally pass in which parent transform we want to give this text to. I want to be a child of this particular transform, so I'm just gonna use transform. Transform is automatically available on all mono behaviors, and it references the transform of this game object. That's all we're gonna do in a spawn object. So finally, we'll define that private void fixed update. We'll check if the spawn and fixed update is true, and then we'll call that same function spawn object. One last thing in the spawn object is after we get that reference to the text, what we wanna do is text.autodestroy time equals auto destroy time. What that's doing is just setting the auto destroy time property of the auto destroy text to be whatever we have set the auto destroy time in the object spawner to be. This way we can override the default auto destroy text auto destroy time with whatever we have here. If we go back to the Unity editor 
on the background, I'll attach the object spawner and I'll change the auto destroy time to one and then drag the countdown text to the prefab reference on the object spawner. And then I'll click play. You'll see that a bunch of countdown text spawn. I'm getting about somewhere between 60 and 70 for the most part, which means I'm getting somewhere between 60 and 70 frames per second. If I change it to spawn and fixed update, you'll see that I have a constant 50 visible on the screen at all times. And that's good because remember that fixed update does not care about your frame rate, mostly. It can be called multiple times per frame. It's a completely separate loop from the update loop. And that's because we don't want physics to necessarily be tied to the frame rate. There can be a lot of weird bugs that come out of that. Most game engines now separate the physics updating from the frame rate updating, and then they kind of reconcile the difference between the two. Now what I want to do is show when do these lifecycle events get called when we're talking about the instantiate flow. To do that, let's set the auto destroy time on awake in the auto destroy text. Remember that immediately after we instantiate this prefab with the auto destroy text on it, we're setting auto destroy time back to whatever we have defined on the object spawner, which is currently one. So if we set auto destroy time to five on awake, what do you think is gonna happen? Will it be five or will it be one? Let's hop into the uni editor and find out. You'll see that it ends up being one, right? And this is expected because we are instantiating that prefab. That means on awake and on enable are immediately called on that script. It's not waiting for the next frame cycle. It's not waiting for anything. As soon as we instantiate it, both awake and enable are called. So you'll see if we put this exact same piece of code into enable, it does not change anything. We get the exact same result here. If we want to override it, we can put it onto start because remember start is delayed until right before the render of the next frame. That doesn't happen immediately when we first create the object. It waits a little bit before start is called. So if we put it into start, okay, now we're using that five second delay. Now you should have a lot better understanding of the life cycle of a game object or mono behavior in Unity. We've talked about awake being the first thing that happens, on enable happening shortly thereafter, start coming in a little bit later, and then when fixed update and update are called and the differences between when you should use fixed update or update. It's really critical to understand these things so that way whenever you're assigning variables, updating variables on potentially different scripts, you're understanding where they're gonna happen and also where should you put your game logic for different types of things, an update or fixed update. Now let's talk about the homework. From last week, there were really two ways that I thought about probably were the ways that you'd approach solving this problem. The first one is probably the easiest way in terms of just thinking through the natural way you might try to approach this based on what we talked about in that video. There's nothing really wrong with this. It does work and it's totally fine if this is the way you implemented it. The hint I gave you was to make it where you could actually write less code. If you take a look at this one, you'll notice it's a little bit different. We instead have a frame counter and we're using this modulus operator. What that does is gives us the remainder if we do division. So if you remember, for me, it was in like elementary school. We talked about if we divide some number by another number, you'll get this with a remainder of three or something. Now for this week, we're gonna do a little bit more complex of a thing. We're gonna start getting some interaction. What I'm gonna want you to do is if someone clicks in, let's say the top 10% of the screen, I want you to spawn a text object at that location, have that start going down. You can use the same prefab that we've been using so far. So whenever it goes either outside of the screen, I want it to be destroyed or if that timer still counts down to zero, it should be destroyed. So using the same prefab, if I click at the top, it should spawn, start moving down, and then destroy. You can set the speed however you want. Maybe you can make it customizable in the inspector. That would be bonus points. In Unity, there's two different input systems. So there's what's called the old input system and the new input system. The old one is deprecated, meaning we shouldn't really use that anymore. That one's a little bit easier to get started with, but the new one is a little bit more complicated. And what I'm gonna do is give you some links to make it where it's relatively easy to use and really similar to what happened with the old input system. That way you can get the mouse position and detect whenever the user clicks. Then we've already talked about everything else you need to know for this. We've talked about the screen size now. We've already done the automatically destroying text. We've talked about instantiating new objects. We've talked about destroying objects. We've talked about vector threes so you can move an object by updating the transform's position. I think you have everything you need to get started on this one. Of course, there will be those documentation links and the hint link as well in the description below. If you've been getting value as video or the series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. Remember, this new video is posted every Tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week.